Okay, welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Modern History Research Seminar, this of the Modern History Research Centre this academic year. I'm delighted to introduce um, Dominic Hodgson, who's a consultant urologist at, at Portsmouth Hospital and is doing a PhD with myself and Graciela about Kenneth Walker, who's a um, major figure in modern urology and had a, a fascinating life. I'm learning a great deal about his multifaceted career from Dominic's PhD. He was a medic in the First World War and we're going to hear about his contribution to World War, World War I medicine in this seminar. He was also involved in male rejuvenation um, and I think you're going to touch on that in, in, in the talk today. He was also a campaigner for um, um, for reforms around homosexuality. So he had all sorts of made all sorts of interesting contributions um, during his lifetime. And I'm very, um, I'm delighted to introduce this talk on new insights into the paradigm shift in battlefield medicine in World War One. that's very much centered on the work of Kenneth Walker. So thank you, Dominic. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thank you, Graciela, um, and for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you today. So, um, as Chris said, I'm, I'm a urologist in Portsmouth and I'm also a lecturer here and um, I'm going to tell you about the paradigm shift that we saw in battlefield medicine in the First World War. So this is a really important time in, in medical history, perhaps the most important time, because it's been said that medicine had made greater progress in the four years of the First World War than any time before or since. And despite a steep learning curve, the Army Medical Services were arguably the most impressive aspect of British operations on the Western Front. So the, 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 the medics in the First World War really, really uh, pulled their weight. So Walker, like me, was a urologist, but unlike me, he served in the First World War. And so I'm going to tell you about him, but just a, a bit of background on him. So, so Walker came from a, a very conventional, in many ways, upper middle class background. He went to medical school in Cambridge, and then he did um, a clinical medicine at Barts. And at Barts, he worked for this man, Sir Anthony Bowlby. So Sir Anthony Bowlby would go on to be the, the, um, the uh, most preeminent surgeon on the Western Front and pretty much ran surgical operations on the, on the Western Front. And his relationship with Walker very much influenced what happened to Walker during the war and immediately after the war. But after Walker worked in Barts, he was a real adventurer. So he went off to Africa, Iceland, India, but then he settled in 1910 in Buenos Aires and set up practice in Buenos Aires in Argentina. But he wasn't particularly happy. And when war broke out, he immediately volunteered uh, initially for the British Red Cross. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to weave Walker's story in the First World War around broader consideration of what was happening in the First World War in terms of personnel in, in, in the uh, army medical services, the state of the army medical services at the beginning of the war, <clears throat> and then the paradigm shifts that had to happen in surgery, anaesthetics, and surgical shocks. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about surgical shock. So surgical shock has got nothing to do with shell shock. Surgical shock basically is the consequences of massive trauma, uh, massive bleeding, and it was it was a, it was a, all a, a, um, a new area of study. And, and it was really responsible for the, the response that uh, we were able to give in terms of medical services. And then I'm going to talk about the legacy afterwards for civilian practice. So if we think for, first about army personnel. So there was no conscription for doctors in the First World War. We got pretty close in 1918 to having conscription. And if the war hadn't turned in, in, in the Allies' favour, we probably would have had a conscription. But we, we never did. But, but about 10% of British doctors like Walker volunteered in the at the outbreak of the of the war. And by 1915, civilians, as opposed to regular doctors, made up about 90% of the army medical services. And the author Warwick Deeping, you might have heard of the author Warwick Deeping. So he, he wrote lots of popular novels in the 30s and 40s. So he was a doctor in West Sussex and then went to study uh, sorry, Doctor in West Sussex and, and then went to war in France. And he wrote in this book, No Hero This, about this, this um, how he was conflicted between the requirements of his patients at home and the requirements in the army. And, and, and young doctors um, came under quite a lot of uh, pressure to 
volunteer and serve in, in the army. Um, and despite there being no conscription, by 1918, half of all British doctors were serving in France. And one of the difficult things for a doctor to get their head around when they when they volunteered for um, service in the army medical services is that in civilian practice, our focus is on the individual. But of course, in the in times of war, the focus is on the on the state, on, on the nation as a whole. And there was conflict. So the regulars were viewed by the volunteers as being inflexible and old fashioned in their views, whereas the volunteers were thought to lack di discipline. And this particularly became an issue when we're thinking about things like malingering and um, and shell shock and an area of great um, conflict was that of awards. So if you were a regular in the army, you were much more likely to be promoted. You were much more likely to work in um, administrative roles and you were much, much more likely to get an award at the end. So Walker wrote, so Walker wrote lots of books later in his life and, he, and uh, his autobiography was called The Intruder. Why should these, those living comfortably in headquarters, far from the front line, seize all the laurels and leave only an occasional star for the thousands who bore the weariness and the wounds of war? So Walker himself was awarded, I'll tell you about it later, a medal after the war, which he basically rejected. So um, so this was another area of, 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 of conflict. So what about the state of the Army Medical Services at the beginning, beginning of the war? So um, this is taken from the Boer War. So the, the Boer War was at the, um, the turn of the century. And you can see that this was fought in relatively dry and sterile conditions. And most of the injuries that men suffered in the Boer War were due to rifle bullets. So these were relatively low velocity injuries um, and different from what would be seen in, in, the, um, in the First World War. But like in the First World War, the Army Medical Service had to be supplemented by civilians. And one of the civilians who went out to the Boer War was Sir Anthony Bowlby. And a major problem in the Boer War was the sanitary conditions. So more men actually died of diseases than they did from war, from war wounds. And this was thought to be somewhat of a national scandal. And there were two royal commissions set up after the Boer War to look into this. And Sir Alfred Keogh became Director General of the RAMC, Royal Army Medical Corps, between 1905 and 1910 to, um, to, to bring in these changes that the commissions recommended. And he reprised his role for the First World War. However, despite his influence, like many aspects of the British Expeditionary Force, the Army Medical Services were pretty ill-prepared for the enormity of what they would face in the First World War. And one of the reasons for this was the environment. So you can see this is a, a wet, muddy, cold field in France. And not only the environment was diff different, the, the munitions were diff different. So three quarters of all wounds in the First World War were suffered as a result of shells. But this was much more um, destructive to the human body than, than, than bullets in the Boer War. And also these muddy French fields had been supplemented by uh, manure from the French by the French farmers. So, so these were full of bacteria. And unfortunately, there was a practice of closing wounds. So soldiers would get injured, their wounds would be full of this um, manure, which was full of bacteria, and then and then the wounds would close, which was a which was a recipe for for some terrible things to happen. And unfortunately, we were very much influenced at that time by this man, um, Lord Joseph Lister. So Lister, who we get Listerine from. So Lister really revolutionized surgery at the end of the 19th century by bringing in asepsis. So asepsis means that surgeons wash their hands, that we um, clean the skin beforehand before making an incision and use drapes, uh, which are all very laudable things and reduced wound infections in civilian practice. But these were wholly inadequate for the, for the far greater uh, trauma that was seen in the First World War. <clears throat> and added to this, there was a vogue for evacuating um, uh, soldiers. So often over several days, when you can imagine these wounds had been closed, these bacteria were breeding, the, um, the men were often in surgical shock. So they'd lost a lot of blood. They didn't have the, um, the circulation, the oxygen in the blood to, to, to help repair. And quite often they developed gas gang gangrene. So, I don't know if you can see here, these, these bubbles of air underneath the skin, 
So this this <laughs> this foot has got um, gas gangrene, and this soldier is probably going to die of this overwhelming sepsis that would have, would have, would have occurred. So at this point, I just need to tell you a little bit about the evacuation chain. So the evacuation chain would start with what we call the collecting zone. So this was this was in the trenches. So each battalion, so battalions about 800 men, would have a regimental medical officer who was positioned in a regimental aid post in the trenches. And he would have probably 12 or 16 stretcher bearers who would go out into the trenches and collect the wounded men and bring them back. And they'd start first aid. If further treatment was required, they would be moved to the evacuation zone. So the evacuation zone consisted of field amb ambulances. So field ambulances aren't um, little trucks that go nino or nino. Field, field ambulances were mobile units, but of course the Western Front was static for all but the very beginning and very end of the war. So they were, for the most part, fixed um, areas. And this is, this is where we would have dressing stations. So um, the men's wounds would be dressed. And if further treatment would be required, they would be moved to a casualty clearing station. So a casualty clearing station would be about eight or nine miles behind the, the line. And as the war went on, some operations would be take, take place in, in the casualty clearing stations. But certainly at the beginning, if you need an operation, you would be moved to a base hospital, either on the French coast or back in uh, the UK. So it was at such a base hospital where Walker started his wartime service. So this was um, the Duchess of Windsor's uh, um, British Red Cross Hospital in Le Touque. And this was actually in a converted casino. You can see the, um, the chandeliers there in, in the casino. And you can also see from this map, so the red dot on the, on the French coast is Le Touque. So this base hospital was situated maybe 40 or 50 miles from the front line. So often by the time the soldiers got there, they were, in a, they were either dead or they were in a terrible state. And Walker describes groping in wounds for ragged lumps of metal, washing out the earth of the trenches, removing, amputating, sewing and splinting. So that the, these men really were often in, in a terrible state. And of course, if you want to operate on people, ideally you would have them anaesthetized. So anaesthetics, general anaesthetics have been around for about 60 years but its use was somewhat haphazard and it only made it onto the medical curricula in 1912. And typically in the First World War, it was the most junior doctor who would administer the anaesthetic. And it's been suggested that the fact that the outcomes were worse from some operations than in the Peninsula War 100 years before, that it was actually the anaesthetic that was killing men. So clearly there was urgent requirement to address issues around surgery, issues around anaesthetics, and also the recognition and management of wound shock. So if we talk about surgery first, so what clearly needed to happen was that the operations needed to take place earlier and nearer to the front. <coughs> so this man is Sir Henry Gray. So he was the second with Bowlby of, of the two men who would have great influence on Walker's career. So he was a real pioneering surgeon and he describes what it was like for a new recruit having to go from England, for, from Britain, to, um, to, to, to work in France. The dimly littered dugout dressing station, the dust, the wet, the mud, the blood, the noise, the bustle, the numbers of wounded, the appalling wounds, the hopeless shock will open his eyes, test his capacity and resource and tend to break his heart as never before. Here is no brilliantly lighted, fully equipped theatre. Here his patients do not come before him in spotless apparel. Here he has not unlimited skilled assistance. Here no aseptic ritual is possible. Here he must content with the very simple things. So just prior to the Somme offensive in 1916, 10 advanced operating centres were set up. Who, which were very close to the, the trenches, closer than the casualty clearing station. And it was to one of these that um, Walker moved in, in 1916 to the uh, small village of Habak. So Habak writes, sorry, Walker writes about Habak. To the Habak chateau were brought men so badly smashed that they would have surely died had they been taken so far back as a casualty clearing station. So it was clearly working 
get these men, try and operate at them before they bled to death. And one of the key initiatives um, that Gray brought in was the idea that you would operate very, very aggressively on these men. So we talk about debriding wounds. So debriding wounds means to cut away all the dead tissue, remove all the uh, the, the the earth of the trenches um, and get them as clean as possible. And, th and then, then the, these wounds wouldn't be breeding ground uh, for things like gas gang gangrene. There was also an obsession about washing out wounds and which was the best solution you used to wash out wounds, which is probably list of influence. But Gray stressed that it was only of secondary importance to be really, really aggressive with how you um, debrided the wound. So after the Somme in 1917, Walker moved to Arras. And just before the Arras British offensive in 1917, he asked to set up an operating centre in uh, the caves in, in, in the town. And to persuade his seniors that he could do this, he wrote of the vital importance of dealing with serious bleedings at the earliest possible moment. During the battle, the roads from Arras would be blocked by reinforcements. Ambulances would be held up, evacuations seriously delayed. And as a result, many men would die from loss of blood. Only by having an emergency theatre as near to the front as possible could this tragedy be avoided. So he's really, really emphasising there the need to have um, a definitive surgery uh, in, in, a, in a timely manner. So unfortunately, on the second night of the Battle of the Rath, the cave was um, shelled and it collapsed. So, so Walker moved into a school in the middle of a Rath and set up um, um, a operating centre there. And the field ambulance that he was attached to wrote, two surgeons, Captain Walker and Kennedy, uh, were, there, were there and a great deal of operations were undertaking, including abdominals. So the reason that abdominals were stressed in this report was that before 1917, it was very, very uncommon to operate on someone for abdominal injury in the war because it was thought it was a death sentence. And therefore, you wouldn't waste resource um, trying to, to, to save someone's life who was probably going to die when you could, when you could um, use that resource on other men. But as the war went on and we got more and more experience, then we would try the try such operations and, and outcomes improved. And this was true in other areas as well, uh, brain surgery and plastic surgery and cardiothoracic surgery. So this um, uh, this this. So new techniques were being practiced and honed and we were pushing the boundaries in what we were able to do. And of course, key to all this was sharing knowledge um, amongst amongst the medics. So uh, Walker and Gray wrote this manual in 1917, and it was shared amongst the British forces, but also our allies. So the Canadians wrote, this was the best summary of the surgery to be performed in regimental aid posts and field ambulances. So what of anaesthetics? So Bowlby, um, was in charge of surgical services across the Western Front, and he he realised that something needed to be done. So he enlisted the help of this man, Geoffrey Marshall, to investigate what was going on with anaesthetics and how it might be improved. So Marshall realised pretty quickly that ether and chloroform were very bad, and particularly chloroform in the presence of shock. And instead, he had um, he he used nitrous oxide, so laughing gas that we we would think of today, and this uh, improved outcomes tremendously. And by 1917, Bowlby insisted that every casualty clearing station would have a dedicated anaesthetist. In the States, this man, Arthur Goodell, served a similar purpose, and he was known as the motorcycle anaesthetist because that was a form of transport he used to visit all his um, training doctors across the front. And um, both men also established the anaesthetist role in assessing and optimising patients prior to uh, having an operation, which was very important when we think about the next thing I'm going to talk about, the recognition of wound shock. So this is a photo taken just before the Battle of the Somme. So the Battle of Somme, uh, as you probably all know, is, is the most deadly day in British military history when 20,000 lives were lost. And not only were 20,000 lives were lost, but there were many, many more that were wounded. And it had a real impact on, on uh, what the Army Medical Services could do. So this is Ernest Cowell, pictured here in the Second World War. So Ernest Cowell was a, a doctor in, in the First World War as well. 
And he said that after the Battle of the Somme, the great need for further knowledge of the pathology of shock was felt more deeply than ever. And the inadequacy of the prevailing methods of treatment was widely recognised. So what did we do about this? So we set up a shock committee in London. So the shock committee in London consisted of the most preeminent and brilliant minds in physiology in the UK. And it was chaired by this man, Ernest Starling. So Ernest Starling was a physiologist um, and perhaps the most important physiologist the country had produced since the time of William Harvey. So Starling um, established lots of rules for physiology that we still use today in medical practice. And Starling led this committee and essentially shock is defined as a condition of circulate, circulatory failure due to deficient entry of blood into the heart. So there's lots of reason why, why um, an, a, a sh an individual might get shocked, but in the, in the First World War, in the main, the reason there's not enough blood getting into the heart is because it's been lost. So that's what we call wound shock or surgical shock. And Cowell and Walker were charged with observing shock in France and reporting to this committee in London and, and, and with their observation. So Cowell had one of these things. So this is a sphygmo manometer. So you all know this um, device because you probably all had your blood pressure taken. But in, 19, in, in, the, in 1914, this was a very, very rare piece of equipment. So Cowell had one of those in, in, um, in France and he went around taking the blood pressure of men who'd been seriously injured in order to assess the effect of shock. And similarly, Walker wrote, what I wanted was badly wounded men caught at the very moment of wounded, wounding so that, that step by step the onset of shock might be studied. So he got those men by attending trench raids. So he would be told when there was a trench raid going across from the, the British to the German side and injured men would come back, he would capture Germans or the, uh, the trench raiders and he would, he would study the effect of their wounds um, on, on causing shock. So now I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of physiology um, in order to, to explain the, the next part of the talk that I'm going to give you. So this is a diagram of the capillaries. So the capillaries are the, the smallest blood vessel in the body and the walls of the capillaries are permeable. So in theory, the pressure that the heart generates could push fluid out from the capillaries into the surrounding tissue. But that doesn't happen, and Starling told us this, because the blood itself contains strong, uh, large proteins which, which um, convey a strong force maintaining the fluid within the blood vessels. So if you lose blood and you want to replace it with something, you need to have um, big proteins in the fluid, otherwise the, the fluid and the blood will just seep into the surrounding tissue. So what the shock committee came up with was putting some, um, some protein from the gum acacia tree. So this was called gum. So it was a protein um, from the gum acacia tree. And then by doing that, you could uh, restore the blood volume, get blood back to the heart, and therefore treat the uh, effects of shock. And, and, and the, such fluids were called colloids. So um, <clears throat> these, are, these are minutes taken from the shock committee. So Walker and Cow were asked to try this, um, this gum acacia in, in France and Walker wasn't very impressed. Um, Captain Walker stated that gum was relatively ineffective and blood had to be used where there was significant, significant um, shock. So, so Walker much, much uh, more favoured the use of blood and he tried to steer the committee into, um, into studying blood and providing blood in the trenches. So the advantage of the blood was that it's physiological. You lose blood, you replace it with the same thing, and it stays in the circulation. But of course, there's issues about compatibility. So that's why we all know our blood, our blood groups. There's issues about donors. So you had to have compatible donors. And some physicians wouldn't even bother checking uh, for compatibility, but they would just accept that some people might die of transfusion reactions rarely. Um, and of course, there was an issue about storage. You can't store blood for very long because it goes off. Colloids, on the other hand, um, is cheaper. It's easier to store. You don't need any donors, but the um, you're not replacing light for light. So the, the colloid can't carry oxygen. Uh, eventually, it leaks out the circulation and there's a risk of infection with it. So much, much of the work of the shock committee for the last two years of the, the war was around this debate about what the best thing to, um, to resuscitate with, which, which were the best fluid to give. 
So now I'm going to talk about once the shock's been established, what we do about it. So of course, prevention is better than cure. So this is Hugh Owen Thomas. So Hugh Owen Thomas was a Welsh man who in the 19th century devised a very good splint for protecting fractured femurs. So the femurs, the, 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 the hip bone, the biggest bone in, in the body. And if you break your femur, you can lose all your blood um, in, into your thigh and potentially die. So he, he devised this brilliant splint, but it was very, very cumbersome, very, very dif difficult to put on. So Walker adapted it so it could be used in the trenches. And it's said that as a result of this adaptation, many thousands of lives were lost, uh, were saved. And this was shared again amongst the British and our allies. And the Australians described this as being the very type and exemplar of shock pre preventers. And of course, Walker had already demonstrated um, prior to the Battle of Arras, if you do have shock, the first thing you need to do is try and stop the bleeding as soon as possible. And he'd made the argument for that. But what about blood transfusion? So blood transfusion had been trialled to some extent in the 19th century, but you had to link um, an artery from a donor to a recipient's vein. Uh, you had to physically link the two. And obviously that was a very difficult thing to do. And there was a risk of incompatibility. Um, and then this man, Carl Landerstein, in, the in 1900, described blood groups the first time. So we, we then knew who it was safe to transfuse between and who it was dangerous to transfuse between. But we still had the issue about storage. Blood clots within a few seconds are coming out the, out the body. Um, um, but then in 1914, just at the eve of the war, these two men, one an Argentinian and one a New Yorker, um, discovered that if you add citrate to blood, it stops it clotting. So therefore you could preserve preserve blood, store it, and then use it when use it at a time when it was needed. So these two men were from the American continent, and therefore it's no surprise that the Americans and the Canadian medics were slightly more au fait with blood transfusion than we were in the British. And this man, Oswald Robertson, is said to have set up the first blood bank in the world on the Western Front in 1917. And Walker got to new, know Robertson, and he writes, my laboratory at the casualty clearing station now became a factory for the preservation of blood. And in quiet periods, we drew off pints of the precious fluid and stored them in a cold dugout. So Walker went actually further from the casualty clearing station and he used to take bottles of blood on ice into the trenches to transfuse men. But this didn't go down particularly well with the regular surgeon, or the regular um, army medics. Blood transfusion in trenches, who ever heard of such a thing? It's highly irregular regular, and contrary to the best traditions of the British Army. So uh, Walker attended the shock committee meeting in London on the 13th of March, 1918. So, so remember this date, the 13th of March, 1918. And he'd actually traveled from France to London with a um, jam jar full of his own blood. And when he got to uh, London, it was looked at under the microscope and the, the, the blood vessels, what we call the corpuscles, were still uh, looked good and healthy. So the minutes say the committee then discussed the possibility of establishing a laboratory for the transfusion and also on the suggestion of Captain Walker for obtaining and preserving corpuscles from selected donors for transmission to the casualty clearing station in France. And it was agreed that the king would donate and the RAF agreed to fly refrigerated blood from England to the casualty clearing stations. So Walker writes, by the time the meeting broke up, everything was settled. The factory as good as started and I began my return to Arras uh, elated with, su su with success. But 13th of March, so on the 18th of March, Ludendorff's spring offensive uh, started. And this was an offensive that almost lost um, the Allies the war. And so any any hope of, of setting up blood transfusion and bringing in blood from uh, from England was lost. Um, although before this had happened and in the last year of the war, um, Walker and Gray also set up a training center um, in one of the casualty clearing stations. So uh, this um, was where Allied medics could come and learn about the techniques of resuscitation and blood transfusion and early intervention. And also the, um, the training centre would loan out equipment. And the Australians described this uh, as a mecca for frontline medical officers. <laughs> 
So as we know, end of 1918, uh, the, the 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 Germans were chased out of France, and 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 on the 11th of November, the war was over. So what about the legacy of all this in civilian practice? So uh, transfusion um, and blood banking pretty became established pretty quickly after the after the war, and of course in the Second World War, we 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 uh, we used lots of blood donated in, in Britain and, and sent to the um, to the to the, the fighting uh, throughout Europe. The other thing that the uh, the war had done is really accelerated specialization in surgery. So we've got thing, uh, areas like plastic surgery, neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and indeed urology, which I practice and Walker practiced. And in 1920, the Royal Society of Medicine set up a section of urology, which was the, the first time that, uh, that urology had been really recognized as a separate surgical discipline. And what about anesthetics? So Marshall, who was the, 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 the doctor who investigated the use of um, inhaled general anesthetic, um, had by the end of the war drawn up blueprints for an anesthetic machine which would mix nitrous ox oxide, oxygen and a little bit of ether, which, um, which forms a base of anesthetic machines that we use to this day. Um, we also established uh, uh, treatments for trauma. So this idea of the golden hour, the first hour when someone has severe trauma uh, came about as a result of the studies that Walker and Cowell and the like had done in the First World War. And one thing that I've sort of noted in, in reading around this subject is the who, who was collaborating. So there was seemed to be very little collaboration between the British and the French and the Belgians, but all the collab collaboration came with our former colonies. And it was just an observation that I think probably for the last hundred years, that sort of link has, has, has remained. So we would collaborate with them, perhaps in preference to our European colleagues. And then also we think about how we integrate experts into um, the military. So obviously there were lots of experts that we needed in the Second World War. And I think we probably learned lessons from the First World War about how best to do that. So what about Walker? So after the war, Walker didn't return to Buenos Aires. He stayed in Europe and applied for a job at Bart's with Gray and with Bowlby as his referees. So you can see here, Bowlby sat in the first front row and a young Walker uh, who would have been 35 by this, 30, 36 by this stage at the back. So how do we appraise his um, contribution? So uh, after the war, um, Gray, wanted to thank all the people that he'd worked with in the Third Army. And he said there were too many to mention, but he wanted to single out Walker, whose work in the Ford area has been of such pioneer kind, so good, so unassuming, and so helpful to wounded men and the medical officers alike. And um, Walker was told that he would be recommended for a Distinguished Service Order. So that's a pretty serious um, award. But instead, he was, uh, he was given OBA. So he wrote to Winston Churchill, who was the then minister who was responsible for such awards and said he didn't want it and he would be ashamed to be found dead in the ditch with it. Um, and it's interesting to note that Starling, perhaps the most brilliant physiologist that, um, that the country's ever produced, wasn't knighted. So, so a lot of the other physiologists on the, on the shock committee were knighted, but Starling wasn't. So maybe like Walker, he, he had similar issues with the authority. So um, Walker was very happy at Bart's. Um, here he is teaching in the 1920s. Um, so he also uh, got interested in masculinity, masculinity and as Chris said, uh, sexuality. And as a sideline in the 1920s, he started looking to rejuvenation, which Chris mentioned. So you can see here that this is a life expectancy curve from the end of the 18th century to the present day. And you can see there's a big dip um, just here, and that's because of the the, the, the lives lost in the, in the First World War and also to the um, the Spanish flu um, epidemic. So there was a requirement in the 20s to try and rejuvenate the ageing men, not least because there was thought that there might be further conflicts. And, and Walker for some time got involved with um, grafting testicles onto um, men, ageing men and men who lost their vitality. Um, but maybe I'll tell you about that another time. Um, so Walker continued to practice as a medic and he became probably more famous as an author. And in the 1920s, he was introduced to the teachings of this man, 
George Gurdjieff. So he, this is a book that he wrote about him. And George Gurdjieff was a, um, a philosopher who sort of blended uh, Western scientific thought and Eastern philosophy. And, he, and, and um, Walker became one of his sort of key disciples and very much influenced the rest of his, his life. He, um, he also, as, as Chris said, towards the end of his life, he was the first chair of the Homosexual Law Reform Society. So the Wolfenden Report came out in 1957 and the Homosexual Law Reform Society was set up um, around then with Walker as first chair to try and change the law. Walker died in 1966 and the law was um, changed in 1967. So sexual acts between men became decriminalised at that point. So this is a picture of an operating theatre of a casualty clearing station towards the end of the war. So it looks like everything there is very controlled. There's a dedicated anaesthetist. So how do we get to that? Well, by the end of the war, only one percent of um, there was only one percent mortality from wounds sustained. Um, and this, the key to this really was the adaptability of the service. So in 1914, if you fractured your femur, you had an 80 percent chance of dying. And by 1918, that was 20%. If you had abdominal injury requiring an operation in 1914, you had an 80% chance of dying as well. And that was reduced to 40% by 1918. And this was really, really crucial to the fact that we won the war. So this is uh, Mark Harrison who wrote, the development of medical services was a vital element of the reforms which transformed the British Expeditionary Force into a war-winning force. An efficient system of casualty disposal and treatment was essential to the manpower intensive form of warfare favoured by Haig, uh, Sir, Sir Douglas Haig, as commander in chief from December 1916. So we really needed to get, you know, these men um, uh, fit and back, back, back in the trenches. So it did have a big impact on the outcome of the war. And I hope that I've explained to you how this was achieved through the integration of the civilian population into with the um, with the regulars the paradigm shifts in surgery, anaesthetics, and surgical shock management. And I've told you about the legacy for civilian practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy. That was a fascinating presentation on the paradigm shift, medical advances during the First World War and Walker's contribution to it. I wonder if there are any questions from the floor. We always start with the floor, then we go with the people online. If people online can raise the, the hands or, or just unmute themselves eventually, but we'll start with the floor first. Yes, if I may. Thank you, Dominic. It was a superb talk. I wonder the trajectory of Walker's uh, relatively short military career. Would it have been different if he had not had a patronage of Bowlby and then latterly Gray? And whether those civilian recruits who didn't have such patronage uh, were destined to have a relatively pedestrian career during uh, the war? I'm sure that that relationship is actually absolutely essential. Um, which, um, yeah, makes you question what, what other people might have achieved if they, if they had the same opportunities. Um, yeah, and, and and the fact that he he knew Bowlby was somewhat by chance because he happened to be his house officer um, in 1905. Because also I've been thinking at the time, the colonies are part of the British Empire. Yeah. So that would be like telling me that you have more collaboration with the Scottish than with the French today. I mean, well, the part of the United Kingdom that is to be accepted. So. I didn't mean the Scottish. Okay. It's the comparison yeah. to the context yeah. at the time. Yeah. It were part of the British Empire. So it, it seems to me that natural that there will be more collaboration than perhaps with the rest of the European countries yeah. that were foreign countries. So, <laughs> So I wonder if, if there's something that is crossing your mind that is particularly strong of a, you know, a collaboration with a particular area, perhaps of a particular colony. Yes, I mean it was it was it was something that when I was preparing the talk, I I just I went, hang on a moment, you know, what's what's happening between the British and the French here? Um, 
And, you know, certainly blood transfusion, that was something that the Americans had started to introduce and the Americans coming into the war in 1917 gave us the opportunity to bring it into British military practice and therefore civilian practice afterwards. The, the French didn't really, um, didn't really cotton on to lots of these things. So, so, so French surgeons have the reputation of being really, really good and have for hundreds of years. That's from a, a surgeon, well, I know that from, as a surgeon. But um, for example, the outcomes from abdominal surgery amongst the French never improved because they never learned, um, as we did, that um, that if you had specialised, you had specialists doing the operations, outcomes were much better. So yeah, it was just an observation that I thought, well, hang on a minute, I'm not reading about any collaboration talk between the, the, the French and the British. It all seems to be uh, with the with the Americans, the Australians, and the Canadians. Yes, well, remember, America is not a colony. <laughs> no. Anymore. Perhaps you could say the Anglophone word, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Just to actually continue on this, because you mentioned the Boer War and uh, and the, some of the elements and correlations somehow. And going back with the idea of partnership, of course, uh, South Africa was also India, very much connected with the conflicts in the Boer War. That later on led to, of course, the involvement in the First World War, uh, of course, on the, the European uh, war theater and uh, in that sense uh, perhaps some of this networking during the war connected with the Boer war but also with uh, India and in South Africa in that connections perhaps is that networking is it something new um, I'm, I'm, that's, that's a very there's a very good point isn't it because I guess you know um, I'm showing my ignorance of, of the wider history here but but I mean I'm not sure when Britain and France had ever fought side by side prior to 1914. So you're right that we had these connections already with the um, with with the with the um, colonies. Yeah. We have a question here from Shelley online. It's a question here, actually. Ah, sorry. Yeah. No, Such a white Shelley. Yeah. The um, I, I just um, plastic surgery is very good in France. Um, I just forgot over a New Zealander who went to France and um, and learnt from the French. And he came back to the Cambridge Military Hospital in Bolshot and set up the facio maxillary unit and then went to Big Mary's Hospital in Stimcup. And um, his nephew, Mackindo, yeah. in the Second World War, did the same thing. Kids. 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 Yeah. Kids. yeah. yeah. And the Kinder. And um, I just wonder a lot of the search, the doctors um, in the colonies had trained in England and they came back for their high professional training. And there was a, a, a two way passage all the way through. Um, and, and that was one reason um, that uh, the colonies. Um, and the Dominions produced the, mm. these chaps. Mm. The other thing, this is the war that was going to be over by Christmas. Mm. And so if you joined up, you actually saw your relatives for Christmas. That was the idea. But in fact, it didn't happen because they got moved out. And the other thing about the Americans, before they were in the war, they sent over the Harvard Medical School um, under um, uh, uh, yeah. And they went into the various British hospitals to learn what we were learning. Mm. And, and that's why the Americans are so good. Can mm. I ask about the shock committee? Yeah. So clearly, Walker was thought well enough off to be invited to meetings of the shock committee. So they knew that he was involved in. Um, well, in the front line in terms of monitoring the impact of wounds and, and, and shock on soldiers. Um, you said there was a disagreement over this gun occasion. Yeah. He said, no, it doesn't work as well as yeah. blood transfusion. Yeah. How, how was that resolved? Was he was his view acted on or was did it remain a case of um, debate? So so Walker got on the shock committee through his uh, relationship with Gray and um and gray was all about trying to um operate uh, as as quickly as possible and and 
Walker had already demonstrated from the uh, splint, the Thomas mm -hmm. splint about about saving uh, lives through shock. So that's that's sort of how he'd come to Gray's attention. Um, the issue, so so the the book that I quoted from from Gray, uh, Walker wrote the chapter on shock in in uh, uh, nineteen and in nineteen nineteen. And um, both Walker and Gray were very much of the opinion that um, the gum wasn't particularly good and blood was a thing to be doing. Blood was a thing to be to be given. And there was a falling out in the minutes. You can see there was a falling right. out because the shock committee had seen that the chapter and they said, look, you're putting too much emphasis on blood as opposed to um, uh, gum. Everyone else is using it. They get on fine. Um, so I guess it was never really resolved. I, I wonder if you were to look at reasons. I mean, we can talk about the whole idea of what award he should have got, but I just wonder if if he'd sort of um, if Walker had put a few noses out of joint, mm. perhaps by not turning the line in terms of what they were trying to do. But obviously, you know, the shock committee, the members of the shock committee had a vested interest in the shock in the in the um, in the success of Gum Acacia um, because you know they 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 invested a lot of time in it. Interestingly, um, in contemporary medical practice, no one uses anything like colloid anymore. Right. Um, so that's probably changed in the last sort of 10, 15 years. But it sort of it goes in cycles. But uh, but it's but 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 I mean, to be fair to the shock committee, you know, giving someone blood 100 years ago was a whole palaver compared to what we would do today. So so I can completely see the idea of getting an artificial fluid that functions in a similar way would be very very attractive. Shelley, if you want to uh, give us your question, you have to unmute yourself and uh, if you like to unmute your camera too, that would be great. Hi. Um, yeah, very early on in the talk, you mentioned the difficulties between the civilian medics. I can see her a little bit. Yeah. yeah sorry, yeah. did you not hear that? Shelley, yeah. can Hi. you hear us? Uh, yeah. You're welcome to, to talk. Hi. To ask your question. Um, early on in the talk, you mentioned the difficulties between the civilian medics and the military medics. Um, I'm wondering if you could expand a bit upon that. And also, how traumatic the civilian medics found the war. Ah, yeah. in the chat? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Oh, I see Maxima. Oh, I think. Yeah, she's really possible. That's your answer. Yeah? No, she wasn't. She was, what you were on the link. Sorry, if you can go back to Shelley's link. There. I. You see, that's muted. Is it? No, she right, unmuted. Did you pass the option to mute them? Uh, hey. So maybe if we should do chat. Yeah, if you could, Shelley, if you could, if you could put it, if you could put something in the chat. Uh, yeah, I'll try and find that. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Where's the chat? Oh. Yeah. Uh, where will I find the chat? <laughs> Um, oh. Shelley, I'm also online and I can hear you, but I don't think the rest of them can hear us. I think they must have muted us in the in the auditorium, but I can yeah, hear you perfectly well. I can hear you oh, too. We can't we can't hear you. And there's no okay. chat function either. Ah, what what about with Shelley? Okay, um, let's try to let's try again. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you tell us your question? <laughs> yeah, you talked earlier on a little bit about the difficulties between civilian medics and the military medics. And I wonder if you could expand a little bit upon that and also how traumatic the civilian medics would have found it compared to the military ones. Yeah, thank you. So, I, I mean, I'm sure they would have found it very traumatic. The the, the book that I refer to, Warwick Deeping, it's a it's a, a novel about a doctor who goes from a rural GP practice in in Sussex to the 
um, to the um, Western Front and, and how, how traumatic it was. And, and obviously the military would have been somewhat battle hardened. Um, perhaps some of them had served in the Boer War uh, beforehand and, and, the, and, the, and they're used to things. Um, so the conflicts were that often the civilians didn't feel that their areas of specialist um, uh, skill were recognised. They would, would be given jobs that were sort of, um, which was probably inappropriate because because their, their, the quality of their the talents wasn't uh, recognised and the speci specialist areas that they were good at weren't exploited. Um, as I said before, they considered the regulars to be inflexible and old fashioned in their ways. The um, the regulars thought that the um, the civilian recruits uh, lacked discipline. So obviously in, in military circles, you know, you need to be disciplined in terms of how you command men. And an area of concern as well between the two was how they managed things like malingering and shell shock. So I think there's a suggestion that um, civilian medics were more likely to be sympathetic to men sh suffering from shell shock, um, whereas the regulars uh, probably took a harder line and, and you were less likely to be um, treated sympathetically um, and maybe even shot uh, if it was thought you were lingering, if you saw a, um, a regular rather than a civilian uh, medic. Thank you. Did you manage to listen to all that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Shelley? Yes, thank you. You tend to speak to uh, Sorry, that's my fault. Can you tell us? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> sorry about the technical issues. Can I ask one um, more? Yes, of course. You showed a photograph of one of the surgery areas and it seemed incredibly clean and, and I wondered how much of that was just a propaganda photo rather than a reality. Yeah, I thought that I thought that too. Um I wonder if it was if it was uh, staged, although it, it did it did look like the man was having an operation on his leg. So um yeah, so I I I, I suspect that might be a, a propaganda photo. Um but but I mean I think the message would be that that Battlefield medicine was really, really turned on its head in the First World War. Um, and obviously that had a big implication for civilian practice, but also had, you know, had massive implications in terms of getting people to survive their injuries. And at the suggestion there of Mark Harris, Harrison, it probably was quite crucial in the fact that we, we, we were eventually successful in the war. Thank you. More questions. Can I follow up Shirley's question in the sense that you said that there was one military figure who said blood transfusion in the trenches, you know, how absurd we don't do it like that. To what extent was there a kind of military inertia, a military resistance to these medical innovations? And it, it, to what extent were, were, the, were the military holding back, um, you know, these sorts of important changes? So that quote is from Walker's autobiography. So we have to bear that in mind when we're thinking about the validity of that. Um, as you can remind me. And uh, and um, but I I think you know the other other there are other sources other than Walker that suggest that 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 the the military was somewhat intransigent. And of course, you know. Um, a lot of the military were very happy in terms of uh, the, the situation that they found themselves in. They were well paid, they weren't necessarily in the firing line the whole time. And when you know the, the sort of innovation came in, and and and, and people were potentially uh, getting promoted and specialising, that was the other thing. It's it's it's, it's very common amongst um, medics in general to to sort of try and resist change because it, it, it suits those who are who are senior and in power. More questions? Yes, so we have some questions up here in the room. So, yes. Um, so, so we see that uh, war teaches lessons about medicine that we previously wouldn't be able to see. How was this sort of experience on uh, Germany, Austria-Hungary, to let's say the Ottoman Empire? Would, the, would these uh, casualty figures be 
lesson throughout the war as lessons were learned. And also you make a point about how um the 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 sort of last one of the dice for Germany in this offensive. When these casualty training stations were captured, would this information be sort of sent to German medics and then be studied back home in Berlin or wherever, or would these stations be rolled back for the retreating army? That's a very interesting question about the role of doctors in war. So um the, there was one British quite senior doctor who was he was captured by the Germans and taken pris prisoner. And they just toured, they, they got him to tour the, the hospital facilities and he was able to comment on the way that they were operating and suggest a few things. So so it's a sort of a professional level, there was sort of a degree of respect between um between the opposing sides. And also, crucially, um, and you know, one hopes that this this will happen in all conflicts. Um, the the German prisoners and wounded prisoners were treated in the same manner as, as the British prisoners, um, and that's not always been the case. So if you think about, for example, Vietnam, you know, you worked through the the, the Americans before you got to the the, the Vietnamese. Um, so I'm not sure if you know, in in terms of compared to other aspects of of the war, whether there was necessarily so much secret, uh, secrecy in terms of, of what was going on um, in terms of uh, um, uh, medical advancements. And certainly the Germans started transfusing by the end of the war. Um, the, uh, and, and, and also their, their outcomes improved, but obviously there were external factors like, you know, they were, they were running out of food. They were, the reason Ludendorff's offensive failed is that they overreached themselves and therefore they couldn't get the supplies behind to, to keep up. So, um, yes, yeah, so there was. But I, I, th I think, you know, this this sort of improvement, even though I, I sort of said that the French perhaps didn't improve in the same way that we we did, this sort of learning was happening across across Europe. Yes. I believe the, the British Medical Journal and the Lancet published um, surgical or just medical things uh, throughout the war, yeah, and so the Germans had access to to the, um, the British medical. Journal. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. point. Yeah. So all the all... <laughs> um, <to laughs> other nations or just to um, yeah universities. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. So so I mean, all the people I've mentioned all published in medical journals during the war. So yes, yeah, so they'd be aware of it and. and, and the idea of blood transfusion and the like, the um, same. Is there a question over there? Yeah. 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 Is the difference between the time that we have? Um, so, as far back as the Vikings, so the Vi if, if, if you were stabbed in battle as a Viking, you were given a, and you had an injury here, you were given a, a strong smelling drink, and then they would sniff the wound. And if you could smell the drink, they would leave you to die because they knew that your gut had been pierced. Um, so, you know, today, if you were, if you were stabbed in the abdomen, your chances of surviving would be far less than having if you fractured a femur. So the, the femur was kind of an easy win because all you had to do was stop the bone shaking around and, and, and very extensive um, uh, uh, blood loss. Interestingly, there was a, a female Russian surgeon in the um, was it the Sino-Russian War in the Sino-Japanese War in, in the in the nine Russia-Japanese War. Russia, sorry, Russia-Japanese War at the beginning of the uh, the, uh, the the century, who had had very good results from abdominal surgery, and you know we're talking about uh, sharing of, um, of papers in general. So if if we'd been aware of her results, we probably would have started doing abdominal surgery earlier in the early in the war and have specialist um, units to do it. But the thinking was it was opportunity costs if you were to prioritise you know these sort of seemingly hopeless cases um, uh, rather than treating people who had salvageable wounds. Yes. Would you say this was like the most important form of medicine or would you say that future wars like the Second World War, Korean War would be more important reducing casualty? Um, so um, my quote at the beginning, I mean obviously 
people have vested interest because it's their period of history, but it's the suggestion that these four years were when things progress more than anything else. Um, and of course, the First World War is seen as doing that from all sorts of aspects of civilization, you know, the end, the end of what we call the long 19th century. So, so things were really progressing. Um, I guess with the Second World War, blood transfusion became more commonplace. Um, Penis antibiotics really sort of kicked off the discovery before the Second World War, but really became a thing in the Second World War. And the other thing that came out of the Second World War, my, my two medical colleagues here might correct me, was chemotherapy. So mustard gas had been used in the in the Second World War, and as a consequence, um, we uh, it was it was it was discovered that it it, uh, it could be a chemotherapeutic agent. So um, um, sadly, all wars, um, I mean, it's, I guess it's one silver lining, but all wars tend to accelerate medical learning because of just the opportunity to, to, try, to try things out and the experience that people gain. We have a question from Keith at home. Keith, will you yes. ask your question? All right. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Ah, good. Um, often when you have huge innovation in one particular area, so on the battlefield, all the resources tend to go into that area. How much was in the tail going back to the, uh, the UK? So, you, because not all of the soldiers would have gone back into line, would they? Um, so do you, you, you mean how, how much care has to be given in the UK compared to France uh, afterwards? Yeah. yeah. Yes, afterwards. Well, I mean, I, I, that's um, that's a that's a, a huge area as well, of course. And if you if you start, you know, the First World War, often we we talk about shell shock. So there was an awful lot of um, picking up the pieces afterwards in terms of, of of shell shock. And of course, the um, the civilian medic medical population had been decimated. So I said that half of all doctors were in France, British doctors were in France by 1918, so those that were left behind had to work really, really hard. And the people that were left behind tended to be those that were over over 40, so they were more more, more senior anyway, maybe less energetic. So yes, I'm, so I'm sure it did have a, a, a big effect on the ability to pick up the pieces. And of course, immediately after the war, we had the, um, the flu epidemic, uh, which I mean, some estimates suggested that 100 million people died as a result of that throughout the world. So, so that would be um, another thing that would really decimate uh, the populations, as, as I showed in that graph of life expectancy. Do you have a comment, Mike? Uh, just yeah. the earlier point, two, two bits. First bit, all wars up until the Fourth World War, and more people died from disease and from surgical wounds or, or battle injuries. So that was that that's where another shift happened. And the other shift was ladies women, women, I suppose I could call them, <laughs> in medicine, doctors. We recruited a lot of lady doctors in the First World War and they served abroad. And um and that was a shift in the medicine mm. in the workforce at mm. home. Um interestingly Bart's was one of the few hospitals that stopped training women after the war, although to train them in the war. Really? <laughs> Do you think that's true of the First World War, though, that more people died of disease and injuries? Oh, yeah. Do you mean soldiers, soldiers or you mean population as a whole? I mean, Richard Stoughton, our colleague, um, he said more, more people died from penetration of the skin by insects uh, um, insects and uh, things like that oh like trench fever like, trench fever like, things yeah um giving you septicemia mosquitoes uh, and those sort of and that's globally sorry that's globally um no that's global, global, for example in the military i don't know, I mean, I don't know how you can separate malaria you know from yeah the troops who worked in malaria uh, greece Actually, ninety mm. percent mm. of our casualties were from malaria. I, I can, I mean, I transfer fever. Obviously, that's a, a transmitted by lice. So I would have thought, if you took the war as a whole, but I would have thought on Western Front, then probably direct injury would be more significant. Yeah. 
No. Yeah. Okay. If you at least take the British military experience, it's at least important that battle injuries have yeah. uh, predominated over disease because management of disease has generally been so good that the only casualties or, or the fatalities are from direct combat injuries. I mean, I, but part of that is improving your medical care so that the, you don't die of your injuries. Yeah. 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 I also wonder if it has to do with the type of the war, if the Falklands War was a three months war. Uh, what we're talking here is about years of war where you have time to get your disease. This, so it may be that there were diseases to be had in the Falklands War too, but it's just that yeah. you have no time to get yeah. them. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think probably has to do with the, the type of yeah. war too. Yeah. Mm. Questions at home, anybody else? Yes, we have another question in the floor. Yeah, I'm just curious if we've got 48 dogs, literally 50% of the doctors actually taking and working in the war, when they come back, come back to civilian life, is there a bounce at all in or improvement in how people are generally being treated back here with their new knowledge? Admittedly, you're not going to get many war situation type things, but just in terms of their general knowledge and I mean, you would hope so. I mean, we were talking before about diseases. So, you know, the, the board had a big, uh, uh, had big advancements in terms of sanitation because we'd, we'd seen lots of diseases there. I mean, it's interesting. My specialty, urology. So, urology is also to do with kidneys and bladders and prostates and things. So, urology didn't really advance from the war at all. You know, the the, the specialties that advanced were plastic surgery and, and neurosurgery and and um, orthopedics. Um, but because the war, as I said there, after the war, these special, these specialist areas of surgery formed, then urology was forced for, forced to form its own um, uh, specialty. So, so um, to to sort of um, coalesce these practitioners. So I guess everyone would benefit to some extent from that. Whether you're, you know, obviously a lot of general practitioners are coming back. I mean, they're probably much better at dealing with um, trauma. Uh, you know, injuries and shock and uh, things like that. So, yeah, so so I, I guess it would have been an improvement. And anesthesia as a specialty really burgeoned after because Chapel of Edison, who served, I think he served the song actually, he came back and set up the association of anesthetists soon afterwards. And many of the returning uh, the doctors who were given anesthesia went on to become very distinguished civilian anesthetists. So, anesthesia certainly. I have to give the uh, best advice because my great aunt was an anesthetist. Right. Okay. So, so you might you might have worked out Jags and these this too. Um, <laughs> um, so because uh, anesthetics didn't really exist as a specialty. Mm -hmm. Not really. Yeah. You had you had physicians who had an interest. Yeah. Well, how the attribution of anesthesia was because uh, they were dependent on what other logistics delivered to them, whether it be either for they they would know they did there. They would have been there for chloroform, and also, as you said, was given to the duly most uh, medical officer to a minister who probably never really had experience of administering uh, anesthesia to battle injured casualties. So, no wonder the recipe, the, the, the combination was a recipe for disaster. Bill Chubbs, Bill Chubbs, Any more questions? Is you, is, if you still have your hand raised, do you have another question? Sorry, if that's to me, KD, the answer is no. Sorry. Oh, okay, right. Anybody else? It looks like you have covered all the ground possible. Keep the gun again. Huh? Oh, no, he's no, 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 he, no, he, he said a no, no, yeah. no, he didn't want to. Yeah. So, fantastic. Okay, well, it's really? always a mark of a good paper when it generates lots of questions. Yes. So, thank you very much. Yes, Somebody very, very good. That was really good, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for your questions. And thank, thank you. you. Everybody at home and we'll be having uh, 
a series of talks in semester two, particularly in March. So come and join us. And uh, if you are not in our mailing list, please uh, send us an email to mhrc at winchester.ac.uk. Uh, so we can let you know uh, when the next talk is coming up. So thank you very much. I have a lovely Christmas. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.